started. Thank you all for being here. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. We're going to be talking about non-kinetic power and the 2014 National Security Strategy. And I include in that everything that has not, nothing to do with battleships and planes and nuclear weapons and uh, stuff that goes boom, which I'm all in favor of, don't get me wrong, but I do think there's obviously uh, an incredible uh, part of our power is not kinetic. It's about our influence, it's about our ideas, it's about our trade, it's about the strength of our economy, it's about our international development, it's our leverage of the multilateral system, it's about our public diplomacy, it's about our exchanges, our people-to-people -people exchanges, it's our connectivity with, through diasporas, uh, it's through our private charitable giving, it's through faith community, it's through the NGO community, it's a whole network of stuff that doesn't have to do with the military and how we use it and how we leverage it is going to be is a big important part of of our power and influence and how we shape the world that we want to live in and when our children to live in um, there are there's a process for the uh, for that has gone on for quite some time and I suspect others are going to have a better sense of how long this has been going on of every four years creating a national security strategy for the United States um, and I'm going to have, uh, we're going to hear from various speakers in, uh, that you have their biographies in front of them. Uh, and I've asked my friend Kath Hicks, who runs our international security program here, who's also um, a former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, to make some opening and framing remarks from a security standpoint. Uh, but before she does, I just want to point out a couple of things. In the 1998 uh, national security strategy, the term climate change was mentioned six times, and in the 2010 uh, strategy, the, cli the term climate change was used 24 times. Uh, the word partnerships was used zero times in the, wor in the strategy in 1998, and the word partnerships was used 44 times in the 2010 strategy. The word extremism was used in the 1998 strategy zero times, and the word extremism was used in 2010 14 times. The word terrorism was used in 1998 48 times, and in the 2010 strategy, it was used 23 times. So it's, if you add up extremism and terrorism, it kind of comes out in the wash, and it's about the same. But the word HIV AIDS was used once in 1998, and in 2010, it was used once in, as well. The word trade was used 90 times in 1998, and was used, trade was used 29 times in 2010. The word democracy was used in 1998 53 times, and the word democracy was used in 2010 24 times, so there was a drop. The word China was used in 1998 48 times, and in 2010 it was used 11 times. And in 1998, the word Iran was used 20 times, and the word Iran in 2010 was used 14 times. I'm going to put this all in a, a commentary, and that was probably too hard to follow it because I went through it quickly. but. And it's, some of it is more surprising than not, but I think it's interesting. It's certainly the words like partnerships sort of jumps up, or um, the word climate change is another one that's on people's minds. So I think, I'm sure we could do all sorts of word cloud exercises around this, and that might be an interesting exercise we can do beyond that. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask my friend Kath Hicks to help frame up this conversation. Kath. Hello to everybody. Um, I like Dan's sense of irony of having the kinetic person open the discussion of non-kinetic uh, approaches on national security strategy. Um, like others in the room, I've been engaged on the national security strategy development in different ways over time, beginning from the mid, early to mid-1990s. Um, and it's actually supposed to be annual, but never has been. It was, uh, it was um, uh, legislated under the Goldwater-Nichols Act in 1986 to have an annual national security strategy, which we did for, for a little bit in the 90s and then stopped and, and did it less frequently. Um, what's, so you can look at, back at a history of NSSs. Um, some things are always different. There are a few things that are, I think, themes that you can carry through. One is that in second terms, NSSs really do start to reflect a little bit more desire than first term NSSs to institutionalize reforms. And so I think you can look 
to see whether this next NSS has that same sense of moving beyond uh, just kind of fast turn initiatives to how you institutionalize the tools of national security strategy that um, uh, the president wants to ensure exist beyond his time and tenure. Um, NSS is, of course, the premier opportunity for the policymaking community to see in Washington and around the world to see how the president and the national security advisor really think about in, uh, integrating the instruments of U.S. national power. And of course, this administration, which I was a part of, um, has really highlighted, particularly in the last several months, the importance of the non-military instruments of power, from this president's State of the Union address to statements that both Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel have made um, about the importance of diplomacy and trade. Um, NSS is, in theory, the place, in theory, where you would see how all of those instruments are operationalized, prioritized, and a sense, at least, of relative resourcing. But of course, that's a lot to lay on a document that, at the end of the day, is really a strategic communication tool. And you have to think about the NSS that way. The difficulty for any public communication tool is you have a lot of audiences with different interests and sometimes their interests are actually contradictory to one another and you're trying to reach them. And I raise that now because I think what you'll see in this NSS, which is consistent across NSSs, is a prioritization on assuring allies and deterring potential adversaries over and above responding to a domestic audience. That will become important, particularly when you think about the resourcing challenges that we face today. Um, you could have this year, of course, we have reduced dollars uh, being dedicated or available for national security. So you, you, in theory, could have more prioritization laid out in the NSS. You could, in theory, have a harder line about what will be spent, what will not be spent. And agencies within the U.S. and certainly allies and partners will be looking to see if there's a reduction in appetite in terms of what the United States how it intends to think of its role in the world and then how it intends to execute that. Um, if you don't have that, you're more likely to have a tone of do more with less. And, and I'm going to just tell you, frankly, I think you're going to hear the latter because there will be this emphasis on trying to make sure that folks feel reassured overseas um, or that they feel sufficiently deterred overseas. I don't think you're going to see much of a reduction in appetite. So let me just leave you four areas where, from a security person's perspective, we would want to see the NSS take on issues of non-military power. The first is um, the issue of stabilization in fragile states. As you all probably know, the Defense Department in 2012 and its defense strategic guidance, which the President signed, um, indicated that it would no longer size its military, its ground forces in particular, but its military for the stabilization mission. And part of the explanation for what would happen in lieu of that kind of sizing, in addition to DOD continuing to maintain its skill set, was turning over more to the civilian sector, civilian instruments of power, their capabilities for stabilization and for um, reducing the security threats that fragile states pose. This NSS is the first one since that statement was made, since the administration made that choice about stabilization and fragile states. And this is the opportunity to see what it is that civilian, the civilian sector will be picking up and what its priorities will be in terms of dealing with fragile states. A second major area is the rebalance to Asia. The Defense Department um, has, in its defense strategic guidance, come out and said, generally speaking, what it plans to do in terms of rebalancing itself. And subsequent to that DSG for the last year or so, there have been a number of opportunities, both in congressional testimony and in speeches, to lay out the posture changes, um, the capability growth areas, et cetera, that the department is taking on. This um, has led to some sense of um, a disconnect within the community of interest around Asia issues to understand how that defense piece fits in with particularly trade um, and a diplomacy and development to maybe to a lesser extent in Asia. So this NSS is a chance to look at rebalance overall, bring the pieces back into balance perhaps to show what the other parts of rebalance will look like. 
And I would just push that a little further and say specifically there's a lot of concern about what is the U.S. strategy toward China, the overall security strategy. So this NSS is a good opportunity to articulate a whole of government strategy toward China and again, from a defense perspective, understand how defense fits in underneath that overall set of um, priorities. The third area I would highlight is the Arab awakening. This is an area that was postdates the last national security strategy. Um, and it's an area where, from the defense side, there's a view that there's not a lot of leverage one can get um, from defense um, activity, certainly not by use of force. Um, although sales and other things come into it, that's more of a diplomatic approach about how you want to use military sales and training. So I think a big question will be, how is this document going to deal with the Arab awakening? What are, in particular, the diplomatic tools and approaches that uh, the United States will use? And then fourth and finally, related but a little bit different, is what is the vision for the counterterrorism mission going forward? There's a lot that's happened uh, at the tactical and operational level, um, s leading to some successes, but also leading to some criticism. And I think this is the time, really, to, for ideally for the president and the national security advisor to talk about what the overall U.S. strategy is on counterterrorism. Are we in an Al-Qaeda 3.0 um, iteration? Is there a global campaign? How do we think about it? Is it a war? Um, do we still need a, um, the uh, authorization for the uh, use of force? Um, or do we have some other construct that we ought to be pursuing, as the President has indicated in the past? Um, and finally, how are things globally prioritized? If this is still a global campaign, if in fact al-Qaeda has diffused around the globe, where are the areas of greatest interest that we ought to be going after? And, and what are those non-military, non-intelligence community kinetic tools? What are the non-kinetic tools that are part of that campaign? So let me stop there and turn it over to Dan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kath. I'm going to ask my panelist colleagues to join me. Thank you. I think that's a uh, very nice way for us to begin the conversation, and I really appreciate Kath taking the time to do that. Um, I've got Peter Fever, who is a professor of political science and the director of the Triangle Institute for Security St Studies and the director for the program in American Grand Strategy at Duke University. I thought I had a long title. That's yeah. great. That's good. Um, but I also the know shorter you are, the longer your title. Yeah, that's that was, how it works. Yeah. Peter Peter also is was a colleague in the Bush administration, but also. Um, and I remember him coming to USAID to speak about the 2006 strategy to AID senior staff. But also, Peter, is it fair to say you're a curator of shadow government? Yes. Dot, yep. dot org. How, what's, the, what's the website for it's, that? Uh, it's, on, it's under foreignpolicy.com. So right. So many of, of you read shadow government. I write for it in a, in a personal capacity. Uh, and I think many people read shadow government to, to see how Republicans are thinking about national security issues. So we have Peter Fever who's with us, and I'm going to ask him to speak first, but I also have my uh, friend and, and colleague, Matt Goodman, who's with us, who's the William E. Simon Chair in Political Economy at CSIS, who um, works a number of different important issues here at CSIS, one is which is G the G20, which he worked ably uh, at the National Security Council under President Obama and also had um, some experience, I think, as a celestial punishment of some kind working on the, on the QDDR, but also has significant experience in Asia as well, both in the private sector and uh, working on issues uh, on Asia in government. And then my friend Diana Olbaum, who is currently a senior associate at CSIS, but is known to many and loved in the development community as someone who is a senior professional staff member at the House Foreign Affairs Committee under the leadership of Howard Berman, who uh, ably led that committee and is really responsible for, I think, one of the most important attempts at trying to reform the Foreign Assistance Act of 1963. And so we're really happy that you're here as well, Diana. So you've got folks who've thought about the national security strategy, folks who've been on the National Security Council, as well as thinking about multilateral use of a multilateral uh, uh, vehicles by which we express our power, as well as folks who've thought about American soft power in the form of development as well on this in this conversation. So I'm going to first ask my friend Peter to kick off the discussion, and we'll just and I'm going to ask Matt and then then Diana to follow. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Dan asked me to speak uh, about the, uh, how the NSS gets written and also how, in particular, the 
Bush administration thought of soft power and how they, that was woven into the, uh, the NSS. And I've got five points uh, to make. The first one begins really with a story when we were sitting down to preparing to uh, start the process of, of the second term national security strategy. We went to all the various departments and agencies to get their input, what, what were they thinking about. And, and at AID, uh, we met with uh, senior leadership there and, and they said, it's vitally important to you that you include in the second, uh, important to us, I should say, that you include in the second national security strategy, the crucial sentence about the three Ds, defense, diplomacy, and uh, development, because we have based our entire uh, marketing campaign and our entire you know, political outreach to the Hill based on that sentence in the national security strategy, and we want to make sure that stays, don't, don't take it out by accident. So I thought, well, the development is no less important to the president now than it was in 2002, so sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. I went back, made a little note to myself, uh, go find that sentence and save it for the 2006 one. And I couldn't find it. And you know, after looking a little while, I, I just asked Will Imboden, who was working with me, you could look, he couldn't find it. So I said, well, let me just call him over. I said, I, I call, or send him an email saying, um, couldn't find it, just, just what is the sentence? Where, where is it? And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll save it. Nothing. A couple hours later, I call over and say, uh, where is it? And they said, well, it's not in the 2002 NSS. It turns out the entire marketing campaign and political outreach campaign had been built around a sentence that they thought was in the NSS, but wasn't in the NSS. Uh, and I said, well, it's going to be hard to keep it in the non if it hasn't. And, uh, we actually wrote a sentence that had defense, diplomacy, and uh, development in it, all those three Ds, although uh, not exactly the way AID wanted us to do it, but we made sure there was such a sentence for them. Uh, but that, that story illustrates my first point, which is what's in the NSS is not necessarily as important as what people think is in the NSS. Uh, and so part of the... The, the challenge of the NSS is what do people think they see in there uh, versus what is actually in there. And we, we discovered that in a back-end way. As, as it turns out, what they saw in there was what was uh, very close to the president's vision anyway, so it wasn't deeply problematic, but you can imagine other ways it would be. First point, what people think is in there is as important as what is actually in there. The second point I would make is what is in there is important, but how it got in there, how it's written is almost as important. Uh, national security strategies get written in very different ways uh, along a spectrum from bottom up to top down. And I've had experience, uh, firsthand experience with two. I helped coordinate uh, President Clinton's national security strategy, the one he re released in 94, so his 1.0. And then I helped uh, with uh, my office, uh, had the lead for President Bush's second, so 2.0. And President Clinton's first was an uh, extremely bottom-up process. Uh, not everything was a bottom-up review in the first uh, Clinton administration, but this, this had multiple, um, really dozens of, of stakeholders. When, when we would send it for clearance to the JCS, it would go out to the all combatant commands. Uh, and we would get back uh, helpful comments from PACOM about uh, Asia strategy, but we also get their views on grammar and you know all this kind of thing. Um, and that was just JCS, that, and not counting dozens uh, around the interagency. Uh, President Bush's 2.0 one was extremely top-down. It was two people, uh, myself and Will Imboden, working directly for Steve Hadley, and there were not, mo it wasn't sent out to the interagency until very, 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 very late, uh, and only at the top level. Um, and both of those models have strengths and weaknesses. So President Clinton's had the weakness of multiple leaks. So several versions leaked. Uh, we would, they'd show up in the front page of the, or not the front page, but they'd show up in the Washington Post and then we'd have the problems dealing with the uh, blowback on drafts. And 
uh, it had a little bit of the committee feel to it, you know, uh, the camel instead of the, the stallion in terms of pros. And I remember at one point, late, late in the process, um, a senior uh, official on the NSC came to me and said, I could write a better NSS than this. I said, any one of us could write a better NSS than this, but none of us could get it cleared interagency. Uh, and that was the strength of the Clinton NSS. There was buy-in. It was cleared interagency, and so it actually did reflect a broad uh, constituent support. The strength of President Bush's uh, 2.0 was it was uh, more coherent uh, in much more of a single voice in the president's voice, I believe. Uh, never leaked, never ever leaked, uh, but then did not have as much buy-in uh, because it was a smaller group of folks who had, you know, uh, blood, sweat, and tears on it. Most people had not. And so I, I, there's a strength and weakness to both sides. What, what is Obama's? Well, Obama 1.0 was somewhere in between. Uh, it wasn't as top-down as President Bush's, it was, but it wasn't as bottom-up as, as Clinton's. So the question was, is, was it the Goldilocks? Did it have the best of both worlds, or was it the, um, uh, the worst of uh, <laughs> both worlds? Uh, and that, I guess, is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, my, my guess is that the 2.0 will be a little more top-down than what uh, the 1.0 was. Third, my third point, uh, because the NSS has one author, the president, multiple ghost writers, and multiple uh, audiences, it'll, it will not always be as clear as, as you might wish it to be. Uh, but all NSSs have an implicit theory of the case. They have a theme to the pudding, uh, if you look closely enough. Uh, and that's that underlying logic that makes sense of it. And I would say that President Obama's 1.0 had this as its theme. To restore our position globally, we have to rebuild ourselves locally. Uh, and most of what was in there derived from that interpretation that we needed to restore ourselves, that there, we had a recovery challenge globally, and that the best way to do that was uh, it's time to do nation building at home kind of mantra. President Bush's uh, was different and plays directly onto the theme of the panel. President Bush's uh, theme was the threats we face will require a hard power response but they will be ultimately vanquished by soft power. Because what matters is not just the distribution of power, but the character of the regimes in those global powers. So it was very much a soft power document, uh, which might be ironic given that the, all the kinetic activity of the Bush uh, term. But if you read the logic and look at it, uh, it is a soft power um, theme. It, it shows up uh, in diplomacy uh, in the sense that we will get, uh, we, by leading, we will get others to follow. That, there, that soft power involves leading and thus persuading others to follow you. It shows up, of course, in development where uh, the Political freedom and, and economic freedom go hand in hand and mutually reinforce each other. And that uh, you can't get one without the other and you shouldn't, uh, you, you should try to move them forward at the, at the same time. By the way, that was the same theory behind President Clinton's uh, 1994 national security strategy of enlargement and engagement, enlarging the, the sphere of market democracies. And at one point I sent little snippets of the draft uh, Bush NSS and the old 94 Clinton NSS around to friends in the White House. I said, okay, guess which one was written by, you know, which president. Uh, there is more continuity across these documents than there is change sometimes. So that's the, thir the third point. The fourth point uh, goes directly to um, the question about President Bush. President Bush saw soft power lines of action partly as a means to an end. That is to say, we will enhance our security through the freedom agenda and better control of ungoverned areas. 
And so the expansion of development aid, expansion of uh, political um, development, democratization, all of this will serve a larger security end. So it's, it's sought partly as a means to an end, but also as an end to itself. In fact, not just an end to itself, but the Bush, President Bush saw it as a moral duty deriving uh, from a concept of stewardship, the idea that to whom much is given from him, much is expected. America is a wealthy country. And when he talked about PEPFAR, he would talk about it in this, in this way. We have the resources. Uh, we have a stewardship obligation of those resources that uh, to address challenges as, as great as uh, AIDS or malaria. Um, and it, uh, it's deep, this moral stewardship is deeply intertwined with, in the President's, President Bush's mind, uh, deeply intertwined with our founding principles, especially the founding principle of equality. There's a single DNA across President Bush's domestic policy and his foreign policy in this regard. It goes from No Child Left Behind uh, to PEPFAR to the Freedom Agenda. And it is the, uh, the, the, in the phrase that the President used, the soft bigotry of low expectations, mm -hmm. right? Why should we say that some Americans are uh, condemned uh, to inferior education? Why, why should we say that some parts of the world should just live with uh, HIV AIDS? Uh, why should we say that democracy is good for advanced industrial countries but not for others? It, it is a, uh, it would be anathema to our founding fathers, our framers, I should say. And it turns American exceptionalism on its head. Yes, America views itself as exceptional precisely because America thinks its values are universal. That is, the things that it wants is, is distinctively what everybody wants. And so when America is being most true to its own self and own values and own interests, it advances our interests, but it also uh, benefits the world. And um, that, that is very much uh, in the national security strategy, but it's very much in President Bush's um, worldview, which of course is what a national security strategy is supposed to do, is to reflect the president's worldview. My fifth and final point is that the measure of a national security strategy is not just the elegance of its aspirations, uh, it's also the diligence of its implementation. And this is a challenge for all administrations, and every administration struggles with this. Certainly, the Bush administration was no exception. I implementation is very, very difficult. And our critics would say, Bush administration critics would say that the Bush administration did not acknowledge the implementation difficulties publicly, uh, didn't acknowledge it enough or didn't acknowledge it soon enough. Uh, we certainly acknowledged it privately, and so we wrestled with this uh, privately. And so that really ends with the question for the, the Obama administration. Do they realize just how big the gap between the rhetorical aspirations of the administration, which are, which are quite large, uh, and the reality of the implementation. That's, it's, it's a gap. Every administration has it. Does this administration know how big that gap is? From the outside, it, it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, but maybe the next national security strategy will uh, reveal what the internal thinking is on that question. Great. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to turn the floor over now to Matt Goodman. OK, thank you, Dan. Um, well, I am um, uh, the economics guy. I'm the international economics uh, uh, person up here, which um, typically means when I'm in a forum about uh, national security means that I'm the, uh, the national security guys like Kath or the life and liberty people, and I'm the pursuit of happiness. Um, You're the in fact, the mere word non-kinetic kind of gives a thrill up my leg. I mean, it's, it's, it's very exciting to be th thought of as, as working on non-kinetic things. Um, and, and slightly more seriously, uh, you know, I think uh, those of us working on international economic policy often have a bit of a chip on our shoulder because economics is, is not uh, always fully integrated into the conversation about national security. Um, I think because it's, you know, economics is hard sometimes to understand and, and uh, it um, is often uh, visibly 
uh, seen as, as kind of a commercial um, uh, uh, matter of, of selling U.S. products around the world and so forth. That, that's sort of easier to, to visualize and take a picture of. Um, but, uh, and I would say that, you know, the, the kinetic stuff is, you know, is, is lower probability but higher impact and, and therefore sort of a little more uh, interesting. Economics is, is sort of, you know, lower impact uh, but, but more frequent and therefore probably suffers from kind of, you know, devaluation of the currency by being around us at all times when you wake up every morning if you've got life and liberty, you're probably going to be thinking about economic issues, you know, where to get breakfast, you know, your job, uh, um, the, your mortgage, and so forth. Not quite as sexy stuff, um, but important. And in fact, I would say that um, uh, when you look at the, uh, as we were uh, sort of thinking about this, framing this based on the 2010 uh, national security strategy, I think it was much easier to see in that context uh, why economics was important in national security. In fact, you know, if you think about the people drafting this, and I was not one of those, I was working in QDDR hell, as, as uh, Dan said, <laughs> over at State in a kind of parallel universe, um, uh, but aware of this going on. You know, we were, those folks were working in the middle of a still unfolding financial crisis, international financial crisis, and so I think that very much shaped uh, the, the 2010 uh, strategy, and if you look back at that, you'll see that uh, uh, recurring throughout. And as an economics person, when I look back at it, and I, you know, one sentence sort of jumps out at me, um, which is the sentence, uh, we, will, we will do so, which is meaning renewing American leadership, we will do so by building upon the sources of our strength at home while shaping an international order that can meet the challenges of our time. Now, that's a broad statement, but I think it basically reflects the fact that, that we were in an economic crisis and we needed, on the one hand, to focus on uh, rebuilding our economy at home, uh, and on the other, we needed to work with others around the world to build sort of a cooperative framework for uh, dealing with uh, international economic challenges. And so, um, in specific terms, uh, the focus there was, was on uh, balanced and sustainable growth, on uh, building out bilateral and multilateral trade uh, agreements on accelerated investment and development, which Diana can, can speak to, and to reform of the, the governance uh, of the international economy in this case. Um, and, and that was reflected really in the shift from a G7 to a G20 world. Um, and um, I think uh, because, because there was a recognition that, that a, a small group of, of advanced countries could not manage uh, the challenges of the international economy and the broader uh, challenges of international governance um, without a, a, a group like that. So if you think since then on all those issues, I'd say there's been partial progress. Uh, you know, the economy is obviously stabilized and is growing again, but not quite as strong as we normally see in it coming out of recovery. Uh, so there's still work to be done there, and there's obviously longer term an interest in, you know, investing in the kinds of foundational issues like infrastructure and education and so forth to build our, our strength at home. Uh, there's been some progress on trade with signing of some big agreements, including the Korea agreement and so forth, but stall the, the Doha round of multilateral talks has stalled. Uh, we're in a, a, a very vocal debate right now about a big trade agreement with Asia, and I'll come back to Asia in a second. Um, and about uh, the authority for the administration to negotiate trade agreements. So that's still a work in progress. Development, again, I'll leave to Diana. Um, and on institutional reform, the G20 was created, did some uh, uh, critical things in the first, uh, you know, three or four summits, and since then has kind of lost some momentum. So again, there's, there's a, a need to revisit uh, some of those issues. Uh, in, t in 2014. So I would expect all of those things to reappear in 2014. Um, I think there'll be probably some shift of emphasis. So um, again, because you know our economic conditions are a bit better, but on the other hand, the long-term challenges are still there, so I think it'll be more focused uh, longer term. There's some very good news in that regard, um, which is on the energy side, and I think that's the biggest probably single change, as I think of in my sort of world. Uh, since 2010. Uh, if you look at the 2010 uh, NSS, it's focused uh, largely on clean energy, uh, and that will continue to be a theme this time, but barely mentioned is unconventional 
uh, energy, shale gas, and so forth, which is, you know, in that period uh, sort of exploded on the scene and has opened up the possibility of not only um, greater economic security uh, for, uh, for the United States, but, but major shifts in, in geostrategic uh, uh, positions. So I think that'll be a much higher uh, focus in, in this time. Um, and then uh, I, I suspect that immigration is also going to feature a little bit more as one of the foundational issues that was discussed um, in, last time. Um, but trade is the one that I'm sort of most interested in in this context, and particularly because Kath mentioned the Asia rebalance, which I, I spend a lot of time on. I think, you know, as I mentioned, we are in the middle of a negotiation of a, a major trade agreement with a, uh, our Asia Pacific partners, the Trans Pacific Partnership, and also starting up an agreement, uh, a negotiation with uh, our European, uh, with the European Union, the Trans, uh, the trade, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's very unfortunate there are all these T's and P's um, in uh, in this world right now. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, those things are intrinsically important because they uh, get to the issues of economic strength, uh, underlying strength of our economy, uh, and to our international engagement, uh, particularly in the, the TPP case with Asia. Uh, and they are critically important to the issue of shaping the rules of the international system. And uh, clearly, explicitly, uh, TPP and TTIP are aimed at uh, trying to update, uphold, uh, champion the, uh, the rules of the international trading system. Uh, and uh, unstated in that, uh, but I'll state it here, is um, dealing with a world in which there are emerging powers, including China, uh, coming onto the scene and trying to get those countries, not to exclude those countries from the international system, on the contrary, to pull them in more deeply and to uh, 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 subject them to the global rules-based system the way uh, the United States is, is, uh, is subject to those rules. So I think there will be uh, quite an emphasis on that, and I would say that to me is the most interesting part. I mean, of those statistics you named, Dan, the one that surprised me was the drop in the reference to China. Uh, I don't know why that is. It may have been because in 98 uh, we were gearing up for the WTO accession for, for China, and there was a lot of energy and activity dealing with China, but why it dropped off so precipitously last time, because it's obviously uh, very important on a lot of levels, but certainly in my world in economics, it's, it's uh, central. So um, I, I expect that to be central uh, this time. So I, I think I'll, I'll sort of leave it with those thoughts and just uh, say that uh, the CSAS, just to shamelessly advertise, the CSAS Asia program collectively does a lot of work on the Asia rebalance, um, whether it's our Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia chairs, or my chair, uh, which is really focused on Asian economics. Um, and we also do a lot of work on economic governance and statecraft, and, and uh, we, uh, we will be following this with great interest to see what kinds of hooks uh, the national security strategy gives us to, uh, you know, to further our work. So thanks. Thanks. Diana. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's important to begin by acknowledging the gap between what the national security strategy actually is and what we might like it to be. And I think um, Kath called it a public communication tool. And, you know, I think particularly in recent years, instead of be being um, a doctrine or a, or a blueprint laying out specific guidelines or clear uh, priorities and, and policy directions. It's really become a public relations document that's designed to make everyone happy and avoid attack. And um, I personally would like to see a much bolder document that actually puts a clear stamp on foreign policy and, and articulates a clear vision of our, of our role in the world. So what I'd like to do is set out what I would like to see in this document if it were gonna be a real, <laughs> if it were gonna be a real strategy as opposed to just a, a public relations tool. So the first and most important thing I would like to see it say is why development is important to our national security. The national security strategy needs to give more than lip service to the three Ds that we've been talking about and the concept of, of, of smart power. We hear all the talk about diplomacy, defense diplomacy and, and development, um, but if you look at the 2010 National Se uh, Security Strategy, out of 52 pages, you'll find exactly five paragraphs devoted to, sustain to sustainable development. And there really was no clear articulation of why sustainable development is important to U.S. national security and national interests. 
there's, there's one sentence that addresses the link between sustainable development and national interests, which I would like to read to you. Through an aggressive and affirmative development agenda and commensurate resources, we can strengthen the regional partners we need to help us stop conflict and counter global criminal networks, build a stable, inclusive global economy with new sources of prosperity, advance democracy and human rights, and ultimately position ourselves to better address key global challenges. So this is really an incredible statement when you think about it. It's not saying that development will create more markets for U.S. exports or level the playing field for American workers. It's not saying that development reduces the risk of pandemic diseases or environmental degradation. It doesn't say that good governance, transparency, and accountability are effective antidotes to transnational crime or that they reduce the risk of violent conflict. And um, what it really does say, in effect, is development creates better partners who will do our bidding for us. And that, that may be a little harsh, but I think it reflects the reality of how we're looking at development as a tool of our foreign policy rather than as an end in itself. Which leads to my second point, <clears throat> development assistance is not a lever of American policy and influence. We have other types of aid that are designed to achieve political purposes. But development assistance is plain and simple, an investment in a better, safer world. It ought to be designed to achieve the maximum development outcomes. We're finally starting to learn the lessons of 50 years of assistance on what makes development assistance effective. The, you know, people talk about country ownership, about transparency and accountability, making it more data-driven, more strategic, harmonizing with other donors. Let's not abandon those lessons in an attempt to leverage aid for short-term diplomatic gains. The third point is that development isn't only about aid. Um, I think it's really high time we started recognizing that aid is only a small drop in the bucket when you're talking about resources for development. Foreign di direct investment, remittances, and domestic resources um, are all quite a bit larger than official development assistance, and private philanthropy is, is rapidly growing as well. Uh, Dan's project uh, here at CSIS on, on prosperity and development has really done some great work on the role of private donors in development, private actors, not just donors. Now that doesn't mean aid isn't important, it just means that our development policy needs to be broader than just aid. And here I think there are really two elephants in the room. The first is the issue of our agricultural and trade policies. These were not touched on at all in the Presidential um, Policy Directive on, um, on Global Development, precisely because of their political sensitivity. But, you know, I think a case can be made that we are doing more damage to developing countries through our agricultural subsidies, our, our tariffs, and our uh, trade quotas than we're helping them with development aid. So if you don't deal with that, you know, I wonder whether we're not offsetting our development aid. And the second is the issue of illicit financial flows. The total volume of aid going into the developing world pales in comparison to the amount of resources that are being siphoned out. Africa loses more each year through illicit outflows than it receives in external aid and foreign direct investment combined. The net outflows were about 1.4 trillion over the past 30 years. That's how much is coming out more than is going in. Um, some of this is due to plain old corruption, you know, bribes, kickbacks, embezzlement, pure and simple. But the vast majority of this is due to tax evasion. In essence, cheating countries out of their natural resources and their financial resources. It's estimated that developing countries lose between 120 and $160 billion each year in tax revenues on wealth that is hidden offshore. And the U.S. is d directly complicit in that by allowing the registration of anonymous shell companies that are the primary vehicle for hiding these illicit resources, for laundering money, for tax evasion, and for, um, and for hiding the profits of transnational crime. I think this is something we really need to address if we want to advance development and our own national security. And finally, um, the one thing 
the last thing that I'd like to see the new national security strategy do is to strengthen the linkage between development, human rights, and conflict prevention. Uh, five and a half years ago, Gail Smith put out what I think is an incredibly impressive document called In Search of Sustainable Security, which was essentially a memo to the next president. It was before Obama was elected about what should be in the next national security strategy. And frankly, I think it, it remains entirely relevant today, despite the fact that she's on the national security staff. Um, a lot of it remains to be done, and I don't think I could really improve on it. One of the points she makes is that America must recalibrate its foreign policy to rely less on military power and more on other tools that can foster change and enhance our security. And I think that's a lot of what we're talking about here is how um, to rely on some of the quote unquote non-kinetic elements of our national security. But in order to do this, we can't just cut defense, which I, I believe is important to do, but doing that alone isn't going to fix the problem. We really need to seriously ramp up our civilian capacities to prevent violent conflict, to transform it, both through direct prevention activities, which are diplomacy, sanctions, dialogue, and through structural prevention, which in essence is development. It's the long-term interventions that are needed to transform uh, socioeconomic and uh, political institutions. And I, Kath also mentioned this in her speech. It's, 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 you, you, if we're gonna rely more on these things, we need to develop them. I think both the last uh, national security strategy and the QDR both talk about this and they, they mention how important it is, but frankly, um, conflict prevention and transformation is still treated as something of a redheaded uh, stepchild, both at state and at USAID. Um, it's something that's way outside the mainstream. It's unconnected and in incidental to the rest of their work. Um, you know, in my view, conflict prevention ought to be one of the main, if not the main, job of the State Department. It's not a special interest. It's not a sideshow. It's what all our diplomats ought to be trained um, and equipped to do. And it's the only way that diplomacy and development are going to be able to take their rightful place alongside defense as, uh, as part of our national security. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diana. I appreciate it. I think you've seen there's a spectrum of views on this panel. I want to put a couple of questions to, to this group, and then I want to open it up. The first one is, this issue of, I think Kath talked about, the, the purpose of a national security strategy is to assure allies, I see a number of folks in, uh, in em, from embassies here, and to deter, deter adversaries. So I guess the question I put to this panel is, is it, do we expect that the, the, the current mix of our power, whether it's uh, uh, both kinetic and non-kinetic as it's sort of being projected out, is it is it assuring to allies and is it going to deter adversaries given the current mix? Do you, do, is the first is is one way to ask that question, and our and another way to ask it might be, are we asking our non kinetic sources of power to sort of fill the gap, where as we pull back on some of our defense work, how are we? Is that realistic? Maybe that's that's another way to. So you can answer either either way is, are we, is is the current mix of non-kinetic and kinetic, is it, is it assuring our allies and deterring adversaries? And, and another way to ask it would be, as I said, is are we asking our non-kinetic power or sources of power to fill in gaps that we're, in essence, maybe I can put it this way, leaving behind uh, with, some of the, with some of the reductions in our, in our defense budget? I'll start with you, Peter, and we'll just go down the panel. So I, uh, I'll answer that, uh, but first I want to say, that there's another very important audience for the NSS, uh, and that is the rest of the U.S. government. Uh, so mm -hmm. part of the NSS is it explains the president's worldview in a comprehensive way that touches more, more elements of the national security apparatus, foreign policy national security apparatus, than anything else the president does. Uh, and that's an important message, because how, how do people who are in the Obama administration know what the president thinks about a topic because uh, they're not in the meetings with him, right? And the NSS is is partly, partly for that. So it, that it is a public relations document, but precisely because it's public, it has to be authoritative and reflect what the president's really thinking. So you can't say things that the president doesn't really believe, because if you do, you're going to get called out on it, and David Sanger will be the first one to call you out on it. Okay, 
in, uh, in answer to your, your question, I would, I would say this, that uh, s soft power, which is the capacity to get other people to want to do what you want them to do, as opposed to hard power, which is the capacity to make them do what you want them to do, uh, can be undermined through two different ways. You can undermine it if you develop the reputation for making lots of mistakes of commission, and so they begin to view you as reckless. So the other, the, the rest of the world doesn't want to be around you because they're afraid that you're um, a calamity Jane. Uh, you can also, though, lose influence if the world comes to view you as unreliable. Or not credible. Uh, well, not, not, can't be depended on. Yeah. They don't, you don't have their back. Uh, and so they're, uh, they're out there alone. I think the, the dominant criticism of the Bush administration was along that first line of, and arguing that, and critics would say that President Bush uh, was in danger of squandering uh, soft power through acts of commission that uh, that other the rest of the world was worried about, you know, invading Iraq or what have you. I think this administration, the the dominant critique on the soft power side would be in that second lane. It would be sins of omission uh, and um, creating vacuums. Uh, and so the challenge for the administration is to convince the rest of the world, uh, both our friends but uh, and our partners, um, that the that the United States is with them, will not <laughs> abandon them, uh, and has their back. And President Obama has actually used that phrase several times. Uh, and the I think. That's to me. That's a sign that the president realizes he's got that. That's a that's a concern that he has to address, and so I would say that is part of uh, a soft power function is persuading other other people that you can be trustworthy, you can be reliable. Matt, so I, I'm not in the deterrence business again. I'm in the pursuit of happiness business. So it's <laughs> um, you know it's it's broadly win-win. I'm obviously you know economics and trade are used as uh, as tools of um, of uh, dissuasion uh, as well. But that's um, you know that that's not really what I think animates you know this this uh, this discussion. I think when I look at this question in the context of Asia, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because actually, as Kath said, uh, the Defense Department is actually explicitly uh, increasing the balance of its, of its um, you know, posture in, in Asia. And so that, uh, at least, you know, again, I defer to, to the defense uh, folks, but, but it seems to me that that isn't certainly intended to both reassure and deter. deter. Uh, in, in that context, but the and, and certainly Asians want uh, the U.S. to play that role in the region and want to be reassured and have the appropriate uh, deterrence uh, capability. They don't want to talk. They want that hard power to be soft. They don't want it to be uh, too uh, much talked about or too visible. And importantly, they want it very much balanced with. Uh, economic engagement because the business of Asia is business and what they're interested in is our economic, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of implicitly want our hard power, but they really want uh, to talk about our economic engagement in the region. And, and this is why uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the current uh, manifestation of our economic strategy in Asia, I mean, I, as a former Treasury guy, actually, don't start with trade normally. I usually start with you know macroeconomic and financial engagement. But I think right now TPP and trade are the are the sharp end of the spear, and uh, you know it's 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 seen in the region and certainly among people who focus on the region as absolutely mission critical that we get this tra trade agreement uh, done uh, to both because of its intrinsic benefits um, and because it uh, is very much wanted in the region uh, as a source of reassurance and not uh, not necessarily deterrence, but but in, a, in the sense that I described it earlier of, of the U.S. continuing to play the role it's played for the last, you know, 60, 70 years of being the champion of the of the rules based order. So uh, so it is absolutely, you know, it is absolutely essential. Okay. Thanks. Diana. 
Well, Dan, your, your question about whether it's reassuring to allies actually has me a little perplexed because, I mean, the truth is we spend more on defense than the next 10 countries in the world put together. And most of our allies are cutting what they're spending on defense. So, I mean, frankly, they'd have a lot of nerve to say, you don't have our back. There, you know, there has to have be some burden sharing if they're that concerned. I think, you know, my sense is most of the concern goes the other way, that we're intervening too much and we're relying too much on, on coercive solutions to things. And so I would hope that most of them would be reassured to see that we're investing more in multilateral <coughs> cooperation and in, and in soft power. Now, there may be some countries like China that are going to be reading the tea leaves on this to think, you know, what is our, um, you know, defensive posture going to be towards them. But frankly, a lot of the countries, I mean, terrorists aren't going to read this. I, I really don't think uh, Assad looks at this and goes, oh, wow, that's going to tell me how they're going to, you know, react in, in Syria. So most of the places where these problems arise, I don't think they're going to look at the national security strategy. Fair enough, I think. Um, I wanted to just comment on something uh, that Diana talked about, this issue of, of trade, agricultural subsidies and uh, in our trade. And I'm thinking about Mali, for example. I think the President of Mali at some point 10 years ago went to the U.S. government and said, you know what, I'd rather not take your foreign aid. What I'd really like is for you to buy my cotton, <laughs> it, which was, I thought, an interesting, uh, you know, frankly, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so I think... Uh, could each of you talk a little bit about, and, and Matt has talked about this, about sort of our economic our economic policies, our trade policies, but Peter, maybe you could talk a little bit about how how in the O, certainly if, if, you, if you reference this in looking at the 94 and the 06 strategies, you could compare and contrast the statements, and they're very similar. Could you talk a little bit about how the trade and economics have kind of played into the into the uh, national security strategy in the past. Peter, start with you. Okay, I'll talk about Matt's area if you make him talk about Duke basketball. Uh, yes, and then, exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the Clinton administration uh, came in with the what was revolutionary for from a Democratic administration uh, w with an embrace of uh, economic. Uh, globalization and economic freedom as uh, the best model for uh, building American uh, uh, economy at home and America, advancing American interests abroad. Uh, and that was maybe not where uh, candidate Clinton was in 92, uh, but that's where uh, uh, Clinton, President Clinton came down uh, very clearly and embracing NAFTA, of course, uh, a big achievement of the Clinton administration. So. The, uh, the, the recognition was that it, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the, the, the way the Cold War ended, that there was an opportunity to uh, reinforce the two pistons of, a, of the American experiment, which was political freedom, democracy, and economic freedom, capitalism, and that the two pistons worked together and that you couldn't have one far outpace the other for very long, that a country that was a, trying to economically liberalize, but not politically liberalize, China being a good example, would find that, that could, they couldn't ride the one piston, that eventually the pressures of the middle class would force political. Uh, but if you want to sustain democ democratic freedoms, you need to have a growing pie you have to, to deliver on democracy. You have to deliver. Ken Wallach's term at the National Democratic Institute. And, and that requires uh, expanded resources, the kind of expanded resources that come from a growing economy. And that, that comes from a country that is willing to uh, uh, embrace globaliz economic globalization and rather than try to hide from mm -hmm. it in an autarkic way. And that was an insight from the Clinton administration that uh, that animated, I think, the, uh, the, the, the Clinton White House. Um, and frankly, the, the President Bush doubled down on it uh, and, uh, and took the rhetoric and the activities of democracy promotion, which were many of them Clinton uh, programs, and expanded, developed it more. Took the emphasis on free trade, 
and expanded it more. Took the development budget and doubled it, uh, which was uh, remarkable. I mean, so yes, the, the defense budget increased, but the development budget doubled. Uh, and that was quite, uh, that, that was directly uh, re reflecting the, the President Bush's view that these pistons work together uh, and reinforce and build, build each other, uh, build on each other, and that you, if you try to do just one without the other, you were not going to make enough progress. So um, I think that, that the presidents, if we, ha if we had President Clinton and President Bush here, they'd be in a violent agreement with uh, this, the, the theme of this panel, which is that you, uh, you can't ignore the, the non-kinetic side and expect that you will deliver on uh, American national security interests. You've got to pay attention to the non-kinetic non side, and, and the Bush administration very much did. Let me, let me actually put this to the panel. I, I'm thinking about, I've, I've heard uh, Matt talked about energy and the shale gas revolution. Kath talked about a series of things that didn't factor into the 2010, the Arab awakening, the pivot to Asia, sort of, okay, where, how, how, do, we, how do we feel about counterterrorism? Do we have a, I guess we don't call it a global war on terror anymore, but there, is, it a, is there a something you know, it's, it's, my, I have a hard time reading sometimes where the administration is on, on that on, is, a, is another way of maybe perhaps putting it. But what would each of you like to see in the, in the document that are sort of non, some of them are military, obviously the, the counterterrorism one is, but, but what, and, and, and as Matt talked about shell gas, but if, if you could talk about sort of th infl things that you'd like to see either underlined or double underlined and I think and and I think obviously Diana did a good job of sort of putting out where some of her wish lists are but if I could maybe ask Peter and Matt and they Diana give you another opportunity just as you're listening to this conversation are there other things you'd like to see in the document what would you like to see in the next in the next iteration in terms of and as you see Matt you talked about shell gas but for example I, I'd like to see something about you know, I actually would make the pitch for this might be something to talk about Ukraine and Eastern Europe or finishing the job there. I mean, if you said to me, what is one of the biggest opportunities we have without having to fire a shot, my view would be is offering the mother of all aid packages to Ukraine right now and saying, why don't you, you know, if you, you do the following things, we're going to take care of your bonds and we're going to help you with your heating oil and we're going to do this with our friends in the European Union and bilateral donors and we're going to leverage the IMF and the World Bank and the EBRD uh, and we're going to, you know, and we're going to you know, make a humongous AID package and we're going to look at the, the, the Germans and the the French uh, and other and the Poles and say, okay, we're all gonna we're gonna give you the mother of all packages and we're gonna get the Orange Revolution 2.0 right this time. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm being a little idealistic, but I think it, I don't think it's that far off. So it could be something like Ukraine. It could be something like the Arab Awakening. Uh, it could be making sure that we finish the job on TPP. What would be sort of what would be sort of those aspirational things that changes the landscape for us from a strategy standpoint we're not invading the full to get through the full to gap if you will right where we're not using kinetic power to to get there so matt why don't we start with you yeah i mean i think um i mean i i i don't think the national security strategy is able to address something as granular as the ukraine situation per se um i mean the other thing about that is i guess we're all the premise of what you're asking is, you know, can we get all this stuff to Ukraine before the Russian tanks roll in? Yes. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, but, um, but I would say more broadly, to me, the issue is, uh, is, is uh, hi highlighting the strategic use of economics uh, to um, support real, to, you know, to support uh, um, underlying change in all those areas you talked about. So when you talk about the Arab Spring, for example, uh, I, I was in the White House when that was un unfolding, and, uh, and, and in fact it became a major, an organizing principle of the G8 summit in France in 2011, uh, right after uh, the Arab Spring, and it turned out the G20, the G8 rather, found a new kind of raison d'etre, because those were a bunch of countries that had you know, historical and present uh, stakes of one kind or another in, in that part of the world. So they actually organized to discuss this. And when we looked at the, uh, the, the I wasn't directly working on, on this, I was working on the G8, but not specifically the Middle East uh, agenda. Um, but, but the focus was very much on uh, 
on economics, and it was on uh, the basic underpinnings of job creation, of um, economic governance, uh, of, um, of trade <laughs> integration, um, and trying to promote those things. Now, whether it's worked or not is another question. Whether it's been implemented fully, whether other things have intervened is another question. But I think that was the right sort of package of things to be focused on in that situation uh, as the Arab Spring was, was unfolding. So I think generally the, the emphasis here should be on how we can use our economic uh, power and our economic tools and our economic thinking, because it's not just about money. It's, in fact, it's very much not about uh, big money dollars that we're throwing at this because we don't have them and, and, and it's not going to solve a lot of these problems. It's, it's about you know, encouraging and incentivizing change within these countries that help produce you know, longer term uh, growth and job creation. Yeah, before Peter, before you jump in, I, I want to just respond to that, Matt. I, I agree with you. I, I have a dream, and my dream is to, to double or triple the number of members of the OECD, for example. I actually think, I know this sounds silly, um, but the OECD is the real country club, if I can put it that way. If you join the OECD, you're signing on to a whole series of norms about taxes, a whole series of norms, and this, I think, speaks to Diana's point about about sort of following a set of rules about corruption, about uh, trade, uh, about sort of norms of good behavior. And so there are a number of countries that are knocking on the door of the OECD. So people are like, why, are, why is Dan getting, uh, why is Dan enthusiastic about people joining the OECD? Well, so Colombia, Costa Rica, Chile, many of the Eastern European countries have all wanted to do it. It doesn't have the same kind of carrots of assistance that the EU has. But it is a good housekeeping seal of approval. We want people to, in line with what Matt was talking about, about um, participating in international norms and joining those norms. The OECD, in my mind, is the gold standard of, uh, of sort of good behavior and norm, norm behavior. We want to have as many countries as possible not cheating, not lying to get in, like we've had some problems with the EU on, on some of this stuff. But my view is, is we want to encourage countries to join the OECD and other sorts of international system uh, organizations like that, I think, similar to what Matt you were saying earlier about, we don't have. It's not about. Sometimes it's about money. It's about this economic thinking or certain kinds of systemic thinking. I mean, the country I think of when you talk about that is Korea, which you know is a country that uh, moved from a position of sort of uh, total in destruction and, in, and in, in, in the in the fifties. Uh, you know, to being now a, a, a firmly entrenched middle middle income and kind of middle aged country, they're suffering a lot of the problems that that uh, more advanced countries are of demographics and uh, and uh, uh, um, you know social security challenges and and inequality and so forth. Uh, but along the way, they joined the OECD, and I've forgotten exactly when it was, but I'm guessing it was sort of early 90s. And, um, and that both was a recognition of how far they had come even at that point, and I think was also an encouragement to them. And, and the thing about Korea is they've done most of the basic things at home that I was talking about, of building good systems of governance and good policy frameworks and you know, trade integration and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. So I think that's, I, I think those, that if that's, if the OECD is ultimately a, um, you know, a, a lodestar that directs uh, countries then I think it is useful in that way. First, and, and actually, before you do, I want to just say, I, th I thought your point about illicit financial flows is really quite telling and I, I think very interesting because the last national security strategy talked about the issue of corruption. I don't, I don't think that had come up before, and maybe it's, you could argue perhaps it's, gran it's, it's granular, but I actually think it's actually not granular. A, it's a, it's a total killer of things like successful democracies. It's a total, if you look at the polling in developing countries, this is one of the top three issues in most countries, and I think 100 countries, it's the it's top three issues is corruption in their society, public corruption. So, and I do think if you look at all the foreign aid that goes into develop, all the ODA, which is the official foreign aid, it's $120 billion more or less every year. So your number of 120 to 160 billion a year leaving Africa, I mean, it's appalling. I mean, it's, 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 it's appalling number. So I, I do think, I actually do think the, these sorts of these, uh, these, and it relates to Matt's comment about economic issues. So, so you might want to either, in, either expand upon that or elaborate that because I know you've been working on those issues. And then also if you can just react to the, the conversation. Sure, so on, on the corruption, I think corruption is one of the things that has been shown to have the strongest link to um, violent conflict. 
And if we're going to try to prevent and, and transform violent conflicts, um, you know, both for our own direct national security, but also because of its importance in, in uh, reducing poverty and, and allowing development. I mean, USAID's been doing some really great work on the links between fragility and poverty. And um, people have been following the, the, the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and I think until 2011, not a single um, MDG had been achieved in a single fragile country. A, a, a few have since uh, made a few of those goals, but, but really there's such a strong link um, between corruption, fragility, conflict, that really, you know, there's no way to do a, a national security strategy without addressing it. But on, on the other question about, you know, what ought to be in it, I realize that, you know, this is probably um, too far for them to be able to go in this political environment. And like I said, you know, this is a, this is, this is a PR document, not a, a strategic thinking piece. But I think we have to start addressing what is national security versus human security. I mean, national security is really about the, the, the security of um, our political institutions, our economy, and uh, our territorial, territorial integrity. And there aren't really a huge number of threats to those things in, in, in this world. But when you talk about human security, which is you know, the safety and security of individual human beings, both in the United States and abroad, that's where you see a lot of the real threats. And terrorism really isn't the biggest one. I, I mean, I think it was eight American citizens had died in terrorist incidents in 2012, um, according to START, this organization that collects these statistics. But, you know, pandemic flu is huge. Air pollution is huge. You know, there's, there's so many things that actually have the potential of hurting average Americans. And the economy is certainly, uh, you know, the international, the global economy is a big part of that. Climate change is huge. We have to start thinking about how we protect individual Americans and not just, you know, the, the state apparatus. I, I want to just push a little bit further. I, it, Kath talked about um, the stabilization. Peter talked about ungoverned spaces. And as I'm listening to your comments, I'm, I'm thinking about the issue of sort of governance and the, the capability of states to actually function and work. I actually do think have, it's, it, it's in line with development, but it's, it's part of a, when we think about things like, okay, we need to be able to collect taxes and actually have governments that work. Um, I, I keep thinking that if you look at the amount of taxes that are collected in Africa, for example, in the year 2000, it was something like $100 billion compared to all foreign aid in the year 2000, which is about $40 billion. By the year 2010, taxes collected in Africa, including oil, gas, and mining revenues, companies in the formal economy, the middle class paying taxes, was about $400 billion in 2010. It's probably a little bit bigger now. But foreign assistance was probably about 60. So what I'm trying to say is the resource mobile, domestic resource mobilization is far larger it's far bigger than foreign assistance, and it's in line with your, your earlier comments about sort of these other forces that are driving development. And so some of it's about, in my mind, is, is how do we have governments that, governments that work, because I do think it does impact our security, having governments that are weak or failing, I think is one of the points you're making, but also to really do attract investment and to actually deliver public goods. So, but I guess the question I have for you, Diana, is is there, instances where you made a, a statement early on about we shouldn't think about this just purely in our national interest. I, I would argue a lot of times there's a Venn diagram where there's a lot of the stuff we're doing is good for development, but a lot of it is in our national interest for a number of different reasons, either just sort of the, for the, the way I just described it to you. So how should we be, is, isn't that how we've sold development up until now? Isn't that we've sold it as, as something that's in our national security interest? And isn't that, isn't that how, the, how we've actually gotten the 150 account financed? Well, I, I think there's a, there's a distinction be, between saying that development is in the U.S. national interest because um, it reduces the risk of conflict, because it creates better trading partners, because of, you know, there's a whole list of, of reasons that um, 
inclusive development with responsive and accountable government institutions creates a, a, a safer and a better world. That's kind of different than saying we're, pers we're pursuing development in order to achieve some other aim. We're, we're going to develop them so that they will vote with us in the UN or that they will you know. I'm okay with that myself, but, but, but I, but I, I hear, but I, I, th I actually think it's very difficult for us to actually buy votes. But, but I think, but I, I share your point, right? I mean, I think the point is that we're trying not to. Uh, but I think they're very. I think there are some instances like that, but I think they're. Few, I, I think they're actually fewer and far between, or it's very hard to sort of justify spending development dollars in ways that aren't actually. Um, you're actually getting something out of spending that money, I think is, right? I mean, I think we have to be able to say, should be able to demonstrate to the taxpayer, especially in this day and age, that we're, there's actually something actually happening on the ground or there's, you know, is that? that? It, it's achieving development goals. It's not just to make people like us. And that's, you know, you can't, look out, you can't go bombing countries and invading them and thinking that, oh, you do a nice, you know, development project, it'll, all will be forgiven, and the, it'll make up, make up for it. That you know, that's not really the way it works. What would you like to see? What would you like to see emphasized or included in this next strategy? Uh, I'll answer that, but first, I want to um, just build on what was said because I think that the you're not you, your line of questioning wasn't giving a soft power its proper due, which is that soft power is is not getting other countries to like us. I think it's a mistake to use the Pew polls as the be-all and end-all measure of our soft power. They're relevant, they're not nothing, but they're not the whole thing. Soft power is getting other states to want what we want, and that's what development can properly done, can do. Get them to want the things of political freedom, openness, uh, an open trading system, the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera, because when they want that and they're pursuing that, that benefits the United States because we play very well in that sandbox. Uh, and so uh, it's wanting them to want that rather than getting them to vote with us in the, the UN Sec Security Council. Now, the more they want what we want, uh, the better partners they'll be. So, I mean, I do think, we, we do think and the kind of problems we'll have will be more manageable. They'll be like France rather than like Russia. You know, the problems we have with France are much better problems to have than the problems we have uh, with Russia or, or other countries uh, that are more um, directly hostile to our interests. So that's, that's where I would see soft power functioning. I would like to see in the, in the, the next national security strategy, I'd like to see the president uh, undo uh, two stumbles, rhetorical stumbles. One is the, uh, it's time to start doing nation building at home. I understand why he did it politically, that made uh, sense, perhaps. But I think it was, it, it fed a neo-isolationist impulse on the left, uh, and there's a neo-isolationist impulse on the right, and both of those are inimical to U.S. larger interests, properly understood. Yeah. And I, I'm, I can just imagine my friends at AID grinding their teeth whenever the president would say, it's time to you know, stop doing, because the implication is let's cut the foreign aid budget and spend it uh, in Brooklyn or whatever. And that, I don't think that's what the president that's meant. That's what he meant, but it, it, but it, it can but it, sound like it that. It did sound that way. And so the, he, there needs to be a full-throated explanation, not just of the development, but of American leadership and, uh, and why American leadership uh, matters. And there, I, I could cut and paste from a couple of the president's speeches where he did it well, and I'd like to see that section expanded in the NSS. The other rhetorical stumble is the lead from behind, which uh, if the administration doesn't come up with a better um, uh, epigram, that will be it for the, the administration. And I think it's, it's a mistake. I understand what the concept was, and I understand it's not official. The president didn't say it. I know the president doesn't like it. But uh, it does capture a reality of the way some people see the administration uh, uh, conducting foreign policy. 
And, the, uh, and it's ironic because the 2010 NSS uses the word lead or leading or leadership more than the Bush administration's one does. So that, there's the shock. Way more leading in the Obama NSS than in the Bush one. So he has a theory of leadership, but it's not well articulated. And, uh, and it's not nuanced, I don't think, yet. It hasn't, he hasn't gotten the sweet spot. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And so I'd like to see them get that uh, right, because the, uh, the, as the president has said on occasion, if, the, if Amer what makes America different is that when other people are not acting, America will act, and by acting, will galvanize the actions of others. And that's a very important a role for the United States, and I hope the President's national security strategy gives that um, due recognition. Let me, before, before Matt, before you jump in, I just want to push Peter on one issue, which is Diana raised something I thought was very interesting, which is around uh, tr uh, pandemics. I can remember mm -hmm. in 05, there was a major collective action activity within the U.S. government on avian flu. It's not gone away. If you asked Andrew Natsios if he was here, he would say it's one of the most dangerous things. If, that, if there was actually a animal to human trans, transmission, this is a, you know, DEFCON 5, big, you know, extremely dangerous situation, I think is the point that, that Diana was raising. And I, how did you deal with that issue in the 06 uh, right. uh, version? So uh, the administration was quite seized with this, as you know, because uh, in the in the fall of 05, as you said, yeah. there's a major major effort. The most, um, in substantive terms, the biggest difference between the Bush 2002 NSS and the Bush 2006 NSS is the addition of a chapter that deals with these kind of challenges of globalization. Uh, and I gather, I wasn't in the administration in 2001, but there was a um, allergic reflex to the term globalization, and that, that was Clinton speak. Uh, and there was a ABC reflex, anything but Clinton kind of allergy in the first uh, term. But uh, when, we're, when we're looking at the, the threats confronting the United States in 2005, 2006, it was obvious that uh, some of these threats were traditional threats. Some of these were fit the pattern of uh, the war on terror, which wasn't traditional but was well established by 2005. And some of them were best understood as the challenges of globalization, the downsides, whether it's man-caused uh, climate change, which is mentioned in the 2006 NSS, it, whether it's uh, pandemics, uh, uh, and, and so on. This, this was something that the administration flagged uh, as, as a priority. And, and so this allows me to disagree one more little bit with Diane on this. Just because it's a public relations document, uh, or maybe because it's a public document, these kinds of statements are actually very important. They are, I, they're like Easter eggs for uh, departments and sub, sub uh, units that may not be getting the love they need inside the State Department or the Defense Department, whatever. But when you elevate that their mission by m having it listed in the NSS, especially if the NSS isn't a laundry list of absolutely everything the administration does, but some get mentioned and some don't. That's a way of the president uh, signaling uh, priorities for things that he wants to see the bureaucracy get pay higher attention to. And so pandemics was, was one that we uh, did in that regard. Yeah, well, yeah. We did not mention shale gas. I reread that section and I thought, man, I could be really proud of myself if we had said that. We did not <laughs> mention it. The we central, did, no, the we, did, we did do climate, but we didn't, okay. but we didn't do shale uh, gas. That was something we didn't see at all. Can, can, can I just say, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, 100 years from now when historians read the 2014 NSS, uh, what I think they should see in there, you know, again, not to flog a dead horse here, but I think uh, the Asia rebalance needs to be prominently um, uh, highlighted uh, and, the Amer and America's position as an Asia Pacific country, because that's not something that I think is widely understood outside the Beltway or east of the Mojave Desert, let's say. I mean, people in California and, and, um, and Hawaii get it, but I think most of the rest of Americans don't understand that we are a Pacific power and that we have huge uh, 
security, political, economic, cultural, other stakes in that part of the world. Um, by the way, three, three times uh, as much of our coastline is lapped by the Pacific as by the Atlantic. So we are a Pacific, you know, we are a Pacific power. And uh, so I, I would want to see that prominently uh, uh, a centerpiece of this. And I think, you know, President Obama in particular should have an interest in this as the first, you know, actual Pacific, Pacific. president born in the middle of that ocean. So, and, and Great. assuming he wasn't born in Kenya. <laughs> Okay. That was the Obama administration uh, speaking person as, saying as, that as not to. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, you all have been. Life to right, oh, all my word. Internet. This is, uh, we've got a very uh, thoughtful audience, and you all have been very, very patient. Thank you uh, for bearing with me while we, we unpack some of these issues. I, I know there's some thoughtful people in the audience that would like to hear from them. I want to hear from Mike Hess and the gentleman in the yellow tie, and we'll, we'll bunch these together, and we'll get several of them. We'll start with Mike. Thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks to the panel. It's been very uh, uh, interesting, and Kath, your introduction on the Connecticut Park was good, too. But going back, uh, Wayne Porter and Puck Mickleby uh, were commissioned by a Connecticut guy, Admiral Mullen, to rewrite the national security strategy, uh, published under an article, Mr. Y, uh, yeah. which was very interesting. Sorry. And they maintain in it that it's time to switch over from a national security strategy of containment which we've been under, they say, presumably for the last 50 years, to one of sustainability, which talks to Diana's points and Matt's and even Peter's. And if this is not a PR document, if we wanted to actually express a vision and some leadership, given that these guys were kinetic, but they're really going for a soft power approach, is it time to do something radical like they did and really change uh, the national security strategy? Okay. Gentlemen. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, University of Wisconsin. In hearing the discussion about soft power, non-kinetic power, alternatives to, to hard power, I can't think of a more authoritative statement on that than former Defense Secretary Bob Gates when, when he said the very same thing. You're asking our defense people to do things that other people do much better, and they asked the Congress to shift strategies. I'm wondering if we look over the past 15 years when we've seen strong efforts in the theater of Afghanistan and Pakistan as a complex of U.S. activity. What would we have done differently? Or what do you think if we were following that advice and had put the appropriate uh, stress on soft power, non-kinetic power, what would we or should we have done differently in that whole Afghan-Pakistan theater of operations than what we have done? Let me ask, so, uh, there's a woman up front here who had, you had your hand up. And we also call on, on this woman as well. I think that my question may be a little long. Do you want to? Well, actually, okay, then why don't, why don't we, thank you. That, thanks for that. Well, I'll, I'll have these folks answer these, and then what we'll do is we'll come back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so why don't you respond to those two questions, and we'll come back to this woman up in the front row. Yeah, Diane, why don't you start with you? All right, well, thanks, Mike. I, I totally agree with you. I would love to see them do something radical, but it's 2014. There's an election. Control of the Senate is, uh, you know, hanging in the balance. And I don't think they want to do something that leaves them open to attack. And anything really new is, is, is going to do that. I, I hope I'm wrong, but anyway. Um, in, in terms of the Iraq and Afghanistan, well, Maybe we wouldn't have invaded Iraq. That would have, that would have changed it. I mean, but the, you know, I think the essential problem is um, that the military argues we we had to do this because the civilians didn't have the capacity to act. And the problem is that they're kind of right. We we haven't built a really strong civilian capacity, and I would say particularly in the area of police training, police assistance, and, and um, creation of security within a state that's, um, you know, for, for the average citizens. We really don't have any capacity to do that, and, and the military is always going to want to step in if we haven't built our own capacity. It doesn't have to be within the U.S. I mean, it could be international. We could we could we could build these, you know, through international institutions, or say, okay, you know, the British will take care of police training, and you know, we'll take care of forensics or whatever it is. But 
you know, we need to establish these, uh, these capacities. It's not just a matter of more money. The State Department as it is and USAID as, they, as it is, if you pump in more money, it's not going to fix the problem. There needs to be a real design around training and, 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 and policy development. So. Makes me think about when the uh, in heaven where the the police are British and the Italian are cooks and the you know the, but and and maybe in hell it's the State Department does police training and et cetera. I'll st right, exactly right. Well, I'm going to call Matt out because uh, um, it is striking that uh, I, I'm going to defend the Obama administration here, the Obama administration would say they have taken this seriously. It was called the QDDR, right? That was supposed to be the effort that did this. That was revel I know you're all shaking your head, and I want to hear about what it was, what, what it was like to be in the trenches. Um, but uh, if that didn't work, the lessons learned from that, I think, would be uh, useful guidance, uh, because um, that, that was a, a deliberate effort to do some of the things that have been talked about on, on this panel. And if it didn't work, why didn't it work? Um, uh, so that, that, that's my, my first point. Uh, the second point um, is somewhat responsive to, to your uh, question was that uh, I think it, it's too late to fix the problem that you identified. If you did not fix that problem when you had Gates and uh, Rice, uh, Condi Rice, who were very much in uh, of a mind in terms of rebalancing between state and DOD, from DOD to state. And then I, I thought it, you couldn't get a better partnership on this issue than those two. And then you had Gates and Clinton, even more of a mind meld, plus a supermajority in the House and the Senate. If you didn't fix it during that two-year window, you're not going to fix it. And it's the only rebalancing you're going to get is, is the faux statistical rebalancing, where by cutting defense, you will then rebalance it that way. But that's not what we're talking about. That's just uh, weaker defense and, uh, and weaker state. So I, I think the, the sweet moment to fix, address this issue was 2009 through 2011, and, and that moment was passed. Um, La That's depressing me. Yes. Uh, the last, uh, but you're in the research think tank business. Ba that's, uh, bad news is good news for you. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> you're not thinking like a grant. Oh, no. Okay, uh, the, the last point is, ironically, I read that, the, that why document differently than you do. That is a public relations document. In fact, their essence of their argument was what we need is a strategic narrative. That wasn't a strategy. That was a search for a narrative, even for a label. Um, and I think that's, that's when this effort goes off the rails, is when this effort being trying to think about national security strategy. When you look for a word preferably a word that rhymes with ainment and then can <laughs> replace containment, uh, that's when the exercise devolves and isn't, isn't so fruitful. I think they're right that you need a strategic narrative. I think President Obama very much needs a strategic narrative. That was my point about what I'd like to see in the NSS. He needs a strategic narrative that works for the American leadership rather than works in a political sense. He has one that has worked politically, but he doesn't have one that works for persuading the American people that it's worth shouldering some of these burdens globally because in the long run, that's a lot cheaper and less burdensome than a come home America response. And I, so he does need a strategic narrative that does that, but looking for the one word, uh, the, the bumper sticker, I think that's, that's not where you find it. But before we go to the next round of questions, I want to come back to Diana just for a, a second. And Are we going to make Matt defend the QDDR? Okay, all right, so, all right. No, I'm giving Matt a pat. Matt, we did do that pat. We saw okay. that you did, yes, episode seven, right? So, no, but Matt did, Matt did actually, def we did have a whole session okay. on the QDDR. Nice. And you're going to have to buy him very expensive drinks, I think, to get the, 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 full, the, full, the full story. But the, 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 but I do, Diana, I want to I come back to something on, 
when I think about the Bush administration and sort of efforts to sort of put some of this capability, whether it was at state and when I was at aid, there was concerns about, well, should we give this to the State Department and what about us and what are we chopped liver over here at AID? Could you talk spam. a little, spam, spam, or spam. Could, could you talk about how the Congress, did, did the Congress basically buy into the view that only the Defense Department could do this and is that is that why it was so difficult to sort of give capabilities to the State Department and aid? Because there seemed as if there was some resistance in Congress to actually empowering either, this at least was in the Bush administration, and maybe, maybe during that two-year window that changed and you were in on the Hill at the time. Can you talk a little bit about how the Congress thought about this, this set of challenges, I think, that were, that were put, put, to the, to put to you all? Yeah, I, I think there's two issues. The first is that defense is just much more popular and has a lot more support on Capitol Hill so that sort of whatever budget they ask for, they get. It's, it's not, you know, there's not the same sense of skepticism and if they, you know, you, you never see committees making enormous cuts in the president's request for defense. Just purely out of, for political reasons. But on the state side, um, the SCRS, the, well, it's not that anymore. The, 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 the conflict reconstruction function at the State Department. Exactly. Um, was kind of forced upon them in a sense. I mean, the, the State Department did create it, but only after Senator Luger had made a big deal about it and, and, and pushed it for a very long time. And then it was never adequately resourced. And the State Department came I think it started during the Bush administration. I don't. Even, it may have started in Clinton. But every year they come up with some plan, this big slush fund, which was going to be to address conflict prevention. But they never had any really good strategy for how this was going to work or um, who was going to do it, and 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 and. You know, it, it was never really thought through. It was just a big slush fund to give money to countries that were experiencing, you know, conflict or, or fragility. I, I don't think that the hard work has really been done to think about the structures and the training and the equipment and the, 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 the whole bureaucratic way of working to, to, to make the the State Department an, an active player in this. And, and you can, the last QDDR, what happened? They couldn't think of anything really major to do about this, so the, the plan was to just steal OTI from USAID and put it at the State Department. The big thing was going to be, okay, now State Department has OTI. So um, a bunch of us raised a big stink, and OTI stayed where it was, and then, <laughs> then uh, you know, Rick Barton came and created the office at, at State, which is, is doing great work, but it's pretty similar to what OTI is doing it at USAID. So there hasn't been another big idea since Brian Atwood created OTI. Okay. Yes, please. I'm ready for you. And I'd also like to hear from uh, this gentleman in the blue, the, the blue shirt and the red tie. Thank you very much. My name is Chin Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I would like to ask everyone to take into account all of what has been put on the table as background of what I'm going to present. Because I'm going You'll to- You'll keep it short, right? Medium, medium short. Um, I'm going to come back to the topic, National Security Strategy 2014. Very short. So there's not adequate time for us to discuss long term. I agree totally with Dr. Oba about everything you said, but that's long term. And I believe our founding father, and especially President Wilson, when he established the League of Nations, has already had in mind that long term global development a, a job that I am going to ask our uh, panels to think about putting China into that role to help us out because they have extra money. 2014, talking about national, that's including all Americans, our people. And I think President Obama made it very clear when he kept saying, we the people, and he said, I'm going to build the middle class of this nation. He made it very clear, national security. The strategy, he made it very clear that I'm going to pivot to Asia, why? Because I'm going to bring jobs, more than 600,000 jobs back to America. We're going to ship jobs and manufacture back to America. That comes with the energy, the shell gas and everything. But then the strategy, I'm having problems with the gap. You talk about the gap, but I haven't heard the right identification of the gap. 
we have not had the clarity. Who is our competitor? Who is our adversary? Who has, for the last 10 years, taken away 2.1 million jobs of American middle class manufacturers? Who has taken our steel industry away? You know that the steel industry was the core development of the middle class in the U.S. for the last many decades. It now, sounds like, it sounds like this, the, the point you want to make is that we, we haven't had a lot of discussion up here about China, right? May I continue? J only just another minute, and then okay. I'm going to cut and, you off. Another minute. I come back to Dr. Matthew Goodman, because he wanted you to talk, and you haven't talked. So I'm going to talk about the currency. For the last 10 years, we lost a lot of leverage. Our deficit came in because of the currency was. We're not talking about that. So then there's the TPP. I'm hoping that the TPP would work. And I believe that we need to address that. Now, talking about Dr. Fever, Piston, you talk about the carrot and the sticks. I believe President Obama had done very well with the carrot and the sticks because we shift all the defense into Asia Pacific. And we, at the same time, invited President Xi over to Sunny Land. We this is the first time we had the highest level of talk between China, and we continue to say that we're embracing China. So I would like to invite Dr. Goodman to talk more about the TPP, and I would like to ask to please somehow ease Vietnam into the TPP, but also, also please demand Vietnam to honor the standards and also respect human rights. Very important. They need to show that they respect human rights. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. This gentleman here with the red tie and the blue shirt. Thank you very much. Peter Michael Nielsen, Defense Counsel at the Danish Embassy here in DC. Um, my question uh, takes off uh, a little bit from some of the last comments on, on the role of Congress. It would seem, of course, both with sort of a, a kinetic and non-kinetic approach, you, you need to work with Congress, but maybe even more so with a non-kinetic approach for the appropriation, for instance, of more funds for development aid, but also in terms of ratifying treaties. Um, what, what is sort of, how do you see the prospects and how much is, how, how strong do you see the, the president sort of working with Congress in order to maybe go towards a more non-kinetic approach? Okay, so comments and questions about the role of China, uh, Viet, so let's call it part of the conversation around pivot to Asia, uh, economic power, economic security, human rights was sort of one bucket, another was around, let's call it presidential, congressional relations and how that relates to national security and national security strategy. So any or all, but maybe Diana, why don't I start with you? I'll take the one about working with Congress. and. Um, you know, it's, it was personally painful to me since I spent the better part of 30 years on Capitol Hill, and I have but a- But you started as a child prodigy, Exactly, Diana. they took me right out of grade school. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I have a, a certain loyalty to the institution, and so I would have imagined that having a president, a vice president, and a secretary of state, both secretaries of state, who all came from the Senate, there would have been a, you know, a much better working relationship between the executive and the legislative branch. But it's turned out that it's, you know, and I, I hate to say this, because I'm, I'm you know, a, an ardent Democrat, but it's, this is the worst relationship between Congress and the administration that I've ever seen. I was much better with, you know, even with Republican presidents and Democratic uh, Congresses, that there was just a much better working relationship. I don't know how much of this is due to the emergence of... Would you say that's also true D to D? I mean, obviously D to yes, R, that's true, but D to D? It was absolutely true, even when the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the presidency. It was just astonishing at how astonishing. little um, consultation, cooperation, and I, I, I honestly don't know why. I will admit that Congress has been um, more harmful than helpful in just about anything that we're talking about here. And so I can completely understand why you'd want to go around Congress because um, we've made things worse in a lot of these areas, absolutely. But I, I'm not sure that ignoring Congress um, makes that any better. And, you know, there, there are people who want to do serious things and who try. Um, you know, maybe my own effort at, or 
Congressman Berman's effort at um, rewriting the Foreign Assistance Act was not something that was destined for success, but not being able to even talk to the administration about it. I mean, they absolutely, I was blacklisted. Nobody was allowed to talk to me about it. I mean, I'm not sure how, I don't see how that really helped their their case. If you're looking for someone to blame, I think it's the G20 Sherpa's office is where they're. <laughs> So uh, uh, there ha we haven't talked a lot about China. I actually think it's very interesting. I mean, we I mentioned at the beginning, but we haven't really discussed China in any. So maybe you just talk well, a little. I bit mean, about I, this. I think I've tried you, you, to yeah, talk yeah, about it certainly. explicitly and, and certainly implicitly. Im implicitly. I mean, yes. it is central to the to the uh, the the Asia uh, rebalance uh, story, um, and you know, I think it's been it's been well articulated uh, that. Uh, you know, that the rise of China is something that the United States should and yes. does welcome. Uh, it's a much better than the alternative. Uh, and so there's no question about that. And I think this administration and the last yeah. seven administrations, going back to President Nixon, I think, agreed with that statement and have worked to try to encourage Chinese development and to encourage uh, China's uh, participation in the global rules-based order. And I think that is a central organizing principle of our, I mean, frankly, our foreign policy more broadly, going back to Nixon, but certainly our Asia strategy. Um, and I think that will continue and should continue. Um, you know, obviously, we don't agree with China about everything, and um, I, I don't sense that Vietnam agrees with China about everything either. Uh, but, um, but, we're gonna get you know, a but I think, Bay, but it's, it's a complicated a relationship I, for both of us. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, as it's frequently said by the administration and others, uh, you know, it's a relationship that involves elements of both cooperation and competition. And we need to try to maximize the areas of comp cooperation and, and manage the areas of competition. Uh, and I think broadly speaking, the last eight administrations have done that. Um, and, and it's been pretty successful overall. Um, and I'm pretty optimistic generally about, about the direction of this as long as we all continue to work in, in, in that direction. Uh, you know, again, I do think the Asia rebalance ought to be central to this. I think TPP right now is yes. central to the Asia rebalance. And so I, I would like to see it uh, put in there. Vietnam is in, is in TPP and that's a very good thing for both uh, us and Vietnam. And I hope Vietnam will help uh, the United States uh, come to an agreement in literally the next few weeks uh, uh, on, this, on this deal, which, which uh, uh, is still a very desirable uh, outcome. Can okay, Peter. I, I want to say that um, as a general rule, national security strategy is not just the documents, but the exercise of thinking about national security strategy is better at identifying threats than opportunities. And so we it's it, Grand strategy is is more often threat oriented, um, but what's interesting about Asia is that it is a place where the last several administrations have seen opportunities as much as threats, uh, and certainly the Bush administration saw an opportunity in uh, India, an opportunity for a deeper partnership, building on some work that had done been done in the Clinton administration, and saw that as a big opportunity. Uh, and this administration has seen an opportunity uh, in uh, Myanmar, uh, where the last yeah. administration didn't see an opportunity there. Uh, and you could argue that the last three have, have um, flirted with an opportunity in Vietnam. Uh, but all three of those have been harder to uh, land. I think it's not just harder to think about uh, Opportunities is also harder to deal, deliver on them, and all three of those have exp uh, lines of opportunity have experienced hiccups, uh, and and so that would be another thing for the, to look for in the 2014. How do they uh, integrate those opportunities and and stitch it into a larger strategy? Just yeah, to please. put a finer point on that, I mean the article from which the term Asia pivot was uh, came, which was Hillary Clinton's article in uh, October November of 2011 um, in uh, foreign policy uh, said we stand at a pivot point and she then went on to say she cast this pivot in terms of moving from areas of the world where there are the greatest risks to a focus on areas of the world in which there are the greatest opportunities and she specifically you know was thinking and maybe even said uh, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan versus Asia. I mean, that's, so that was what it was all about, was seeking opportunity. Diana. 
I just want to thank Peter for that because I think one of the very major shifts, positive shifts that the new national security strategy could do is instead of framing the world as a place of threats and dangers, to start seeing it as a world of opportunities and interests. And really, you know, putting it in that frame would make a very big difference. It Well, absolutely, China is both an opportunity and a challenge. Well, a challenge. And under the category of challenge, I would include, you know, a violation of copyrights, uh, IP, intellectual property, cyber war. These are all uh, major, major concerns, Con currency manipulation. Uh, it's easier to say that when you're outside of government than when you're uh, actually inside government. Uh, but uh, so... So I, I, I don't think, actually, as a, as a partisan outsider, there was a brief moment in 2009 where it seemed like the administration was naive on the issue, but I don't think I've detected naivete since they see the, the challenges uh, that come from it. It's challenge and opportunity. I'm, I'm just thinking about the time. You all have been very generous and very patient. You guys have a lot of stamina to sit through two hours of this. Thank you very, very much. I think we've captured a lot of lessons learned here. We're going to put in a commentary that we're going to uh, share with the administration. Thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>